My name is Dave Frankowski, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's class. And welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. The school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958. We hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside Branch was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside Branch, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the President, Dr. Carl Emler. Now in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of, of the Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which were contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifest in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted as Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles. They are not names. And the Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It is a divine title because it is a title that our creator has chosen for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. And a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, signified on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of this chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body, and he walked the earth plane as Yahshua, the Messiah who the whole world calls Jesus Christ. 
Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So a simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what did they call this man when he walked the earth plane? And a further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build a physical one in the wilderness, just like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. And the tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The 10 primary constitutional objectives or aims of the Institute are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this evening with a prayer by Dr. Bruce Geller, and we'll have a scripture read, which will be 1 John, the third chapter, and that'll be read by Dr. Jerry Geller. One moment. Good afternoon, class. May we all bow our hearts and minds in a moment of prayer and let us be go into that closet that Yahshua told us to go into, to come in contact with that Holy Spirit and to be ever thankful for the fact that Yahweh has taken us out of darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. We just ask that we can become more conscious of his ever presence and to be strengthened in these last days because we're in perilous times but we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we know has the power to bring us through anything and everything. We just want to thank you, Yahshua, from our hearts. 
because we know that loving you is what this thing really is about. And we want to thank you again in Yahshua, the Messiah's most holy name. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Good evening, class. Tonight, I'll be reading 1 John, the third chapter from the Holy Name Bible. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of Yahweh. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the children of Yahweh, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the adversary, for the adversary sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Yahweh was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the adversary. Whosoever is, is born of Yahweh does not practice sin, for his sin remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of Yahweh. In this the children of Yahweh are manifest, and the children of the adversary. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of Yahweh, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the Savior's love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of Yahweh in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, Yahweh is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward Yahweh. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Yahshua the Messiah, and love one another as he hath given us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. First John, the third chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller and Dr. Bruce Geller. Uh, this evening, we will have a three-speaker format. Our scripture readers this evening will be Dr. Linda Volpe and Dr. Gail Josephson. And our first speaker this evening from our Syracuse branch will be Dr. Deb Cometti. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was um, I was really just like writing, jotting down all these things that were jumping off the page with this um, this chapter. Um, I just saw like right away this contrasting uh, theme going on about you know who might be the um, manifesting the mystery of iniquity and who would be manifesting the uh, sons of right you know the Elohim being in righteousness. Um, it was saying that whosoever is born of Yahweh Elohim does not commit sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of Elohim. So it just, okay, here's where my mind went. He cannot sin. So I'm thinking, okay, like here's the analogy that went through my head. If you had an elephant and you dropped him off a ship in the middle of the ocean, he cannot survive. I don't think, I think he would just, you know, crash to the bottom. I don't think an elephant could swim up all, all that stuff. If he can, I'm wrong. But anyway, I'm thinking the same analogy is if you took a huge whale and you dropped him off in the middle of the desert, he cannot survive. And neither the, the elephant nor the whale, neither one of them righteous or unrighteous, just showing us principles. And um, Dennis was talking um, the other day about working a principle down through the book. And uh, this is something that is uh, definitely opened up to Yahweh's children. It's like this um, curtain being pulled back from the flesh and showing us the reality of things and showing us the principles and not getting hung up on the manifestation. In other words, uh, when I was in the Methodist church uh, and we would learn about um, the stories in the Bible and we would learn about Adam and Eve, that was definitely an actual serpent that we were taught was hanging on that tree and um, fooled Eve into taking a bite of the so-called apple, which we find out none of that was how it really went down. And when you start to understand that um, like sometimes you might uh, be talking about somebody that uh, did you wrong and you say, yeah, that guy's a rat. Well, that guy is not an actual rodent. He just portrays somebody that's sneaky and slippery and somebody that you don't want to have around and doesn't show good characteristics. Like, you know, um, when Yahshua came on the scene and they said, behold, the lamb of God, behold, the lamb of Yahweh, you know, what does a lamb uh, bring forth in your mind, like a lamb or a little bunny or something like that. That's even something that you would buy like a stuffed animal for a, a newborn baby. But you wouldn't think about um, taking something that looks like it's flesh eating and vicious, like a boar or something like that, and getting that as a stuffed animal for a little baby because of what it represents. We want that innocence and we want that meekness and that you know that beautifulness of them so Yahweh has put these creatures in the creation to show principles but neither is any of them one mystery or the other so when he's saying that if you're born of Yahweh you cannot sin because that spirit is in you and that's such a uh, confidence and that's such a uh, comfort in these times where um, you can second guess things that are happening. You can sometimes second guess people, second guess the situation you find yourself in. And he's let us know in these scriptures, um, when your heart is full of Yahshua, the things that will be happening. So uh, I'll ask the scripture reader to start out in the first verse. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of Yahweh. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the children of Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, when um, Jerry was reading that, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, how Yahshua is pure and us being the bride of Yahshua or us being the body and him being the head, we also are pure. So when you get down to the, uh, the I'll just skip down for a minute to the 20th verse. Um, it, it gives you uh, some indication of what's going on when you find yourself in the body of Yahshua. And we're talking about this pureness or this purity and the truth of the matter, because it's so hard these days to find truth in any of our carnal, you know, comings and goings. Uh, in this class, it's a different story. People come forth and they uh, give to each other what Yahshua has given them to say. And it only does glorify Yahshua. And um, when, uh, you know, Bruce was saying out of darkness into this marvelous light, I want somebody to find, I think it's, um, no, that's the wrong, that's the wrong story. But I want somebody to find where Yahshua uh, gives that man his sight. And uh, then I'll ask somebody while they're looking for that verse, I'll ask somebody to read uh, the 20th and uh, 21st verses of the scripture. Alrighty, uh, 20. For if our heart condemn us, Elohim is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward Yahweh. So being carnally minded before we had a revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. Uh, we were constantly in a condemnation, or even if you didn't think it was condemnation towards God, or you know, we were constantly in conflict, um, looking for something. Some people would find it in uh, burying themselves in the books. Uh, some people would go to higher education. Some people would uh, go to, you know, trying to be an Olympic champion, burying yourself in things that um, would give you some kind of satisfaction. Some people, I was watching this the other day about rock climbing, and these people actually climb mountains without any gear, without any ropes, without anything but just themselves. And so they're looking for that immensity within themselves, that high. And what we found when we come into class is we suddenly have a soothing bomb to the soul where our heart no longer condemns us because we're in this purity. We're in this body of Yahshua, the Messiah. And we, we have that confidence toward Elohim that we no longer are uh, in a condemned state. We no longer find ourselves wrapped up in things that would not be pleasing to the father we just, we have this confidence. And um, one of the ways a manifestation is when you have confidence is when you're in the light. And that's where I'm going with what Bruce talked about in the prayer that Yahshua brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light. And you know yourself, when you're trying to walk, uh, you know, through your house and there's no lights on, even though it's your own home, you know, you could stub your toe or you could run into something because it's dark and it's totally different when the lights are on. So Yahshua has done this to us. He's opened our hearts. He's opened our, our eyes to the spirit into this marvelous light. So do we have that example? It might be in Matthew. Um, I Mark have 820. Okay. Thank you. That's what I was thinking. Um, Mark eight and 20. And when this, uh, how about 22? Okay. And, and he cometh to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto him and besought and yeah, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Perfect. Now, this is a notable miracle done. This is Yahshua showing that he has power over all flesh. And 
it is not to say that we want to stop there. Now, granted, this this is incredible, but it's only to get you to the next place or the next step to understand how amazing, how incredible it is for Yahshua to open our blind eyes to the spirit. See, we can't just stop there um, with the blind man getting his sight. And there's also one, uh, it's it's pretty good. It's in John the eighth chapter. Um, it kind of talks on the same idea. And what it what it is that these things are being set up where these people are actually physically uh, have ailments in the flesh and Yahshua is going to come along and heal them. But that's not where we stop because the body inevitably will die. And we all know that. So we want to see the next step. We want to jump to the next uh, level, so to speak, and see this in the spirit and see people that are blind to the spirit, having their eyes open, seeing people healed. And like I said, Dr. Kinley called the tabernacle a soothing bomb to the soul because suddenly you can see the workings of the creator and you can pick it apart and you can go down as deep as you want, or you can see it, you know, you can dig into it as much as you want is my point and see how Yahweh designed this pattern for us to be able to know how he actually is and works in an example. Okay. He's not a tabernacle and we're not going to construct one and, and have to, you know, go worship to it. But we do get the idea when Yahshua says that he was, you know, that they said Yahshua was the lamb. We get the idea. It's not just a little, you know, quirky thing to say about a man. It actually takes you back to a point where a lamb was offered up in place of the Israelite for sin. Now you got the uh, manifestation. So the principle is set up that when Yahshua was on that cross, he's the lamb and he's taking on your sin. And it suddenly brings it into a different reality. It brings it into something that you can grab onto. So let's go over to John, the eighth chapter for a minute. I just want to show how these things in the flesh at the time Yahshua was on the earth plane, how they showed something more than just, you know, an incredible miracle. Go ahead. Where would oh, you like to start? I'm sorry, this isn't the one. Uh, it's where the um, the person is uh, lame. I'm in the wrong scripture. The person's lame. And um, no, it's the what nine. Hebrews 12? No, I'm sorry, Reeb. It's nine and one, not eight and one. Okay. John. John 9, 1. And Yahshua passed by. And as Yahshua passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? So now right away, they're equating a sin is equal to blindness or lame or, you know, some kind of infirmity in the flesh. And I must say that, you know, a lot of times when things would happen to me or happen to people like in class that were pretty devastating, I would always think, you know, what did we do wrong? What happened? How did that, you know, come about? And, you know, Yahshua definitely has shown me that that is, that is not the case. And, um, you know, um, that when things happen to us and, and happen to our brethren, there's, there's nothing that's, you know, not going to happen to us. It doesn't happen to people out in the world, but yet it's the way we manifest and have the confidence in the faith of Yahshua that's going to make us, you know, different and in that pure heart. Uh, go ahead, Linda. Three, Yahshua answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of Elohim should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, go wash the pool of, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. 
He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, I just want to bring out the point that this is, this is a notable miracle. And this was definitely for the people to see that Yahshua had power over the flesh to do these kind of things. And they even say, uh, Nicodemus even says, you know, over in John, the third chapter, he's like, we know, you know, we know that you are a teacher come from Yahweh Elohim. No man can do the miracles that you do us except Elohim be with him. Okay. And we know we've talked about that Elohim be with him, you know, Emmanuel. And that's what they said in the prophets that he would be called. And so he's doing these powerful powerful things and also you know when he makes the uh you know the fishes and he makes all this food and out of nothing and the wind and the waves everything is obedient unto him he is saying that that the work in verse three he says the parents didn't sin and neither did the child because he said he was born from his blind from his birth but he said but that the works of Elohim should be made manifest in him. And, you know, that gives me a confidence that when things are going a way that I wouldn't think are necessarily most holy place things, um, I'm reminded that this is Yahshua's purpose and that the works of Yahshua might be made manifest. So if something befalls me and it's, you know, not the lottery, then I maybe the way I handle it and maybe the, the things that I say and do might show somebody that's watching that I don't know they're watching that, you know, the faith in the operation of Yahshua, the Messiah. So he's saying that nobody did anything wrong in this case. It's just that the works of Yahweh might be made manifest that Yahshua would come along and that he would, um, by, you know, spitting on the ground and making clay, and telling the man to go wash that he would be, um, he would be gather his sight. And, you know, I'll just throw this out. If anybody knows, uh, they can say later, but I just, I don't know what the uh, significance of the spitting on the ground and the clay, I don't know what the significance of any of that is, but I know it has to be something. So we'll just uh, put that as an open question out there that, you know, um, what, what part, what does that mean? What, what's Yahshua fulfilling there? Um, the other place is where Yahshua, um, he brings Lazarus out of the, out of the tomb. What, what, um, what chapter is that, uh, scripture readers, where he, Yahshua brings Lazarus out, he calls them. I think it's John 11. John 11. Thanks, Sash. Yep, um, it's John 11 and okay, 1. Okay, now let's see here. So that we're talking fun. about, um, uh, it might be 32 we could pick it up at. Sure. Um, 11 and 32. Then when Mary was come where Yahshua was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Master, if thou had, hast been here, my brother had not died. When Yahshua therefore foresaw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, right away, reading this without the Holy Spirit to guide you, you would think, you know, Yahshua is all caught up in the, in the sadness and the crying too. And it's, that's not that way. Uh, we keep, read on. 34 and said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, master, come and see. Yahshua wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. Now see what's happening here. Um, and the Jews said, oh, wow, he, you know, he really, he really loved Lazarus. And I know that Mary and Martha and, you know, they had a, a closer uh, relationship than some of the other uh, people. But when it says that Yahshua wept, it's going back to way back in Genesis and the story of Joseph, when Joseph wept 
because his brethren did not know him, did not recognize him. And you, and if you read back there, the story, it says you could, you could hear Joseph wailing throughout the whole, um, I don't know what it was called, the whole, you know, place where he was, he was wailing because his brethren didn't know who he was. And it wasn't that, oh, because he's crying because Lazarus has passed away. Keep reading. We'll find out. Right. Um, and 37, and some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Now you see where they're all going with this. Keep going. Yeshua, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Yeshua said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Master, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Yeshua said unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of Elohim? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Yahshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. 43. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, and do, you, do you see the power of what's happening there? So he's saying, you know, I thank Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you hear me also. So would it make sense? Would it stand to reason that up in, you know, the 35th verse, uh, he wept and, you know, he's getting all caught up with all the all the crying people and everything. It doesn't, doesn't stand to reason. It doesn't make sense when he knows he's going to say, Lazarus, come forth. Why, why is that going to be? Well, they may have forgotten. Go over, Gail, and get 25. 25. Yahshua said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, you see where this is going? So, mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, if somebody close to me is laying down dead and I already know I have the power to bring them back from the dead, just like, you know, somebody laying on the couch sleeping and you call them, you know, you have the power to wake them up. So <laughs> you're not crying and, and carrying on, you know, why are you laying down sleeping? You know that by your voice and by shaking somebody, you know you have the you're going to wake them up. So Yahshua has already declared, "I am the resurrection. I am the life." Okay, and we're not just talking about physical life, although He is that also. All right. So He's saying, "I am the resurrection." So now He's going to manifest what He has declared, and He's saying. I'm doing this. I, I, I already know that, you know, what's going to happen, but I'm doing this because of the people who stand by. He said it, he spoke it, he spoke it. And then it came to pass. Can we get, um, I think it's Isaiah. Is it 33 and six there? This will be the prophet talking about, uh, what we're talking about here. And, um, he's saying to, he said to his disciples, that they would do even greater works than the things that he had done. And that's what we're doing tonight. And every, every time we speak at all ever about Yahshua, the Messiah is working towards somebody. I don't want to say working like it's, you know, labor in that sense, but it's like in the sense that we're trying to get something across that somebody might understand Yahshua, the Messiah. And by us, like when you see back in Genesis, he spoke first and then Moses saw, let there, he, let there be light. And then Moses saw the light. So he speaks the word and then whammo, then there's the manifestation or there's, you know, the sign following. So when we say the words of Yahshua, the Messiah, in hopes that somebody might hear something and like talking about back to that prayer, we were in the darkness and he brought us into this marvelous light. And once you see 
anything. Once you're turned on, it's like that blind man. It wasn't that he only could see certain hours of the day or he could only see certain things, certain colors. From that point on, he could see. And so that's our promise now in this flesh. From this point on, when you get that light turned on, from that point on, you can see. Can you see everything? Can you see as much as the next person? Maybe not. But you have to have faith in the operation of Yahshua that whatever you see is enough. Okay, you're in the body. Um, okay, so I probably didn't call that one right either. Boy, I'm getting rusty. I want where he spoke and it stood fast. Mm. I know it's in Isaiah, but it's not 30. Let's see here. There's something in Psalms 33 and 9. Okay. That sounds like it. Thanks, Greg. Psalms instead of Isaiah. Psalms, Psalms 33 and 9. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He spoke. He told Moses up there in the vision. He spoke and he said, let there be light. And it stood fast and there was light. Okay. And uh, pick up six, Linda. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And that's how we can understand. Now we know it, it came in instantaneously, but that's how we can understand. And that's how we can grasp by the word. And what is the word? Yahweh Elohim speaking. Mm -hmm. And it says over there that, you know, faith comes by hearing and that by the word of Yahweh. And so all these things we see and understand are gifts. And that was also talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the power of that Holy Spirit. Don't, you know, don't sell it short because there is nothing that we can't do that Yahshua has given us to do. And sometimes that seems like, you know, it's just putting up with somebody, uh, I'll say at work or uh, dealing with an ailment, uh, dealing with some kind of crisis, um, never pleasant when you're in the court roundabout. But if you just know the pattern, you know that the pattern never consisted of people just staying in that court roundabout where it was stinky and it was bloody and they were offering up you know, lambs and, you know, things cut up and they had to wash it in the blood of the um, labor. And it was just really kind of um, not, not the most pleasant, but that's not the whole working of the tabernacle isn't just the court roundabout because the next thing you're going to go into another compartment and suddenly, first of all, it's closed over. So you're out of the hot sun of the desert. You, there's a uh, light of candles. There's a pleasant smelling of an incense and there's food on the table. So, and also there's angels embroidered all around there. So suddenly you're in a different, you know, environment and you're definitely in a different category of the way your senses and your feelings and the things that you're experiencing are going to take place. Now that's the, the priest could go in there and they would minister in there um, all the time. Okay, they go from the court roundabout, they go into the um, holy place. But uh, once a year, and we just passed October 10th, where that was on the calendar as the time that um, the Day of Atonement took place, where the high priest got to go in there and, you know, it was in the presence of that Holy Spirit that the prayer Bruce was talking about, okay? in the presence of Yahweh Elohim. And there is a scripture also in the um, prophets that said, the steps of a righteous man are ordered. So it's not just to leave it back there in the desert with a, a clan of people called the Israelites that this high priest once a year, he gets, he's got to go in there and he's told on how to you know go around. It was brought, thank you. It was brought out the other day that, um, you know, he could uh, not turn his back on the most holy place, uh, on, on that mercy seat. And there was a witness given that it, the comet in the heavens never has its tail 
towards the sun. It's always facing the sun. So, you know, this most holy place was a place to be where the priest saw a light, a flash of the Shekinah. And I'm not talking about natural light. I'm talking about uh, supernatural. I'm talking about something that was in like a vision for that priest to know that atonement had been made. And when he, the priests on the other side of that veil, the low priest, they're waiting, they're listening for the bells on his garment to see if he's coming out or if he's not. So when they hear the bells, and then what do they do? They blow the trumpet. And all the people that are supposed to be, um, you know, in their tents, but they're supposed to be in uh, attention to what's going on on this day of atonement. And then when they all hear the trumpets, that is as the gospel being preached to say, you know, here's the good news, folks, death, burial, resurrection. And that was a type and that was an example to get us to understand when Yahshua comes in, his death, we should know the death of the lamb. We should know the burial is going to come just by that pattern. And then we're going to know there's absolutely going to be a resurrection. So when Yahshua says to those people over there in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. It's, it's not something he's coming up with psychedelically, something new. It has been designed all the way from the law and the prophets. Those are Yahweh's words to his people to understand what's going on. So we, in this time, we're in purity, we're in truth, we're in confidence, and our souls are not condemned, and we don't deal every day with condemnation because we are the bride. And we, when a bride and her husband get married, it's a beautiful thing. And if it's in love and it's in righteousness, it is a, a consummation that's absolutely to show what the true reality of the husband and the bride are, which is Yahshua and his bride. And that's who we are. So we have this confidence towards Yahweh that um, our heart doesn't condemn us. And we have this, this um, hope of just waiting for that immortal glorification and, you know, to get that new, new body. So um, I hope somebody um, was encouraged and got something out of the words. Uh, that were brought to me to give to you. And um, I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deb Cometti. And our next speaker this evening will be from our Rhode Island class, Dr. Sue Sikelski. Good evening. Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you. Um, very much enjoyed what Deb had to say. Um, there were so many things in what she brought out. Um, I'm going to tr try to stay a little bit focused here. Um, the whole episode in John 9 with the blind man and people asking who sinned, did his parents sin, why was he blind, and Yahshua healed him. If you read on in that episode, it it remains kind of interesting because he goes to tell people what happened and the story gets spread about him being healed from blindness. And the Pharisees um, try to pin down like, how did this heal healing happen? They talk to the parents. And because it says in, in that chapter that the parents knew that they might get thrown out of the synagogue if they actually confirmed that Yahshua had healed their son. So they were avoiding the question. And then the Pharisees went to the young man and he essentially says, all I can tell you is I was blind and now I can see. Um, so I, you think about that and I'm thinking about the position that the parents and the young man who got healed were put in and they were afraid to testify to what had really happened, which is unfortunate and which is sad. Um, it takes me, it makes me think about um, Romans, the first chapter, if we could go there. Uh, and I'd like to start a little bit ahead of um, where we normally read. If we could start Romans one at verse 11, 
I would appreciate that. Thank you. Romans 1 and 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. All right, this is Paul speaking to the people that were in the class in Rome. And these were Gentiles. These were not Jews. So they were um, those that got brought in seven years after the day of Pentecost when there was a Gentiles Pentecost and Paul was out preaching to the Gentiles. And so he's saying that he would like to see them being established. Could we get established in the dictionary, please? We ended up working with this word in our Rhode Island class today, and it has some um, interesting uh, aspects to it that I'd like to mention um, before we move on. And the word, so it would be establish would be the word in the dictionary. Um, I have to found, institute, build, or bring into being on a firm or stable basis. That's establish. All right. Um, establish is to put, to bring something into being or to put it on firm ground. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the other words, um, that we we found when we were researching this today to um, uh, permanently attach, to mm -hmm. make stable, and to make um, immovable was another explanation we found or another word mm -hmm. we found in a, in a dictionary. And if you think about what Paul is saying, he wants them to be established and we also want to be established. We want to be on firm footing. We want to be fixed soundly in what we know and understand. So if uh, we don't need to get it right now, but if you go into Hebrews 12, towards the end of the chapter, it talks about us having a, a kingdom that is immovable and can't be shaken. And that's what this teaching gives to us that we didn't have when we came in here from whatever background we had in the world, whether it was uh, religious or, or not, there were things that we placed our faith in, we pay, placed our confidence in and knew that they weren't gonna hold up. And these days, all of that is being sorely tested for people in the world who unfortunately are getting hit from every direction with things that will shake them and they have nowhere to turn, nowhere to try and understand, nowhere to get an, a, a firm foundation. So Paul's talking about establishing these people that were in Rome. Could we keep reading uh, where we are in Romans, please? Yep, one and 12. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as, it, as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And so Paul talks about how he's a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. He's showing that Yahweh has no respecter of person relative to preaching this gospel. He's out there trying to reveal something to all of those, regardless of, as we say in our second aim, the, their background, their caste, their color, um, and that can get extrapolated when I hear that aim read in my mind. I also think, uh, does it matter what your age is? Does it matter what your um, physical size is? Does not matter whether you can speak well or not? Does not matter what your education is? Yahweh doesn't care about any of those things. Uh, the brethren, the nucleus of brethren that he's putting together 
has nothing to do with anything in the flesh. And so Paul's trying to point out to them that it doesn't matter that they are from a Gentile background or not, or wise or unwise. He, he's preaching the gospel to everybody who wants to hear it, who's willing to listen. Read. 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua, for it is the power of Elohim unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul made a point of saying he wasn't ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of Elohim unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now, we've talked in, about this from the angle of sometimes we might have been embarrassed to carry a Bible to class or to be seen with a Bible or to tell people we were going to a, a religious class or um, anything along those lines, depending mm -hmm. on what our background was, there might have been an element of embarrassment or, or feeling ashamed or having a hard time being able to explain that to people in the world. What occurred to me was a question. If Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, then what would be a better way to describe it? He's saying it that way for a reason, and I understand that. But Paul not only wasn't ashamed of the gospel, Paul was joyful in the gospel. Paul was confident in the gospel. He had an experience that transformed his thinking, as have we all had, maybe not quite as dramatic as described for Paul, but he it brought him great joy. He was not embarrassed. He was not apologetic. Um, I was trying to think through a lot of words. He was assured. He was confident. He was joyful. Some of these things Deb was talking about relative to, to understanding the gospel and what state of mind that puts us in. If we go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1, if you would pick that up, Paul talks a bit more about uh, how important the gospel was to him. First Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and in which ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. All right, and so Paul again is reiterating, he's delivering unto them that which was delivered unto him. And we all have a tendency to want to share this gospel that way. Whatever made an impression on us when we came in, that's what we tend to gravitate to, to try and explain to, to new people where we see the, the treasure in this gospel and where the joy is and where the confidence is for us. And it differs depending on, on each person and what made an impression on them when they first came to class. So Paul's saying, I'm given to you what was given to me and, and, and made a hook and hooked me on this gospel, made me a prisoner of this gospel essentially is a phrase that he uses. And he talks about um, the, the ability of that to, to save you if you believe in it. And uh, he, he talks about it being the death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures, which we understand to be the gospel. Um, gospel meaning good news when you look up what the etymology of it is. He understood how that took him from the things because he was, he was well-studied, well-learned, um, a Pharisee. He believed his salvation was all the things that the Hebrew people had believed about being the promised people and the laws of Yahweh that they had had. And he saw how that had been fulfilled by Yahshua and new covenant brought in and it had been made very real for him. So he, the gospel truly was the good news for Paul. And he just never stopped reiterating that to people when we read in his epistles in the New Testament. Now, I want to detour for one minute. Um, in the um, 
policy manual that had gotten got sent out that we were talking a little bit about before class started. Um, I had just been scanning through a little bit of it. As somebody mentioned, it's 108 pages. So if you are going to work your way through, it's probably gonna take a little bit of studying or reading. But in the first section of it under um, item 19, which is labeled nature of lessons. So this is the IDMR policy manual, uh, nature of lessons. There's a very brief paragraph and this is what it says. The IDMR shall consider it necessary, sacred and divine to examine and study the construction of the Godhead, the universe in its totality and all known sciences as applied or related thereto. The lessons and lectures shall be systematically arranged and predicated upon the true name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The unity of the Godhead, the archetypal pattern of the universe, the validity of the Bible, excusing mistranslations and interpolations as explained by the pattern, the institution and fulfillment of the old covenant and the new covenant and sciences as far as current knowledge goes. To me, that says the nature of our lessons are the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, the gospel of the kingdom. And that that's what we say in this school we should be teaching. That's what our, our um, purpose is. So it's interesting because there's a lot of discussion about some of those things not being thought to be valid anymore or to be important anymore. And yet it's still in that policy manual and it still is consistent with what's in the scriptures about Yahweh's gospel that's important to mankind for salvation. So I just thought, um, please go in there and, and double check it for yourself so that you know that I'm reading it accurately out of the information, but it's right in that material that we just got sent out again. So. Um, it is our good news. Now, Paul's not ashamed. So in Corinthians, he goes on to reiterate about the gospel. Oh, thank you, Greg, for putting that up. Um, he goes in to talk about the gospel in, um, Acts the 17th chapter, which I know was read recently as a scripture reading in a class that I listened to. Paul is at Mars Hill and Paul goes up and he very, unashamedly, boldly, with great confidence, starts to tell those people, starts to preach to those people about Yahweh, about that unknown God that they had listed up there on all of their, their various idols, the idol to the unknown God. He, let me tell you about that unknown God. And so Paul, if you read in Acts 17, he was not ashamed of the gospel when he was preaching to those people at Mars Hill. Stephen in Acts, when he was brought up in front of the, um, the Hebrew leadership, the Jewish leadership, and he gave that, that whole speech that was like a class, he was not ashamed of the gospel and of what he had come to understand. And he just boldly put that out there and confidently told those people. And one of the verses says, when they were looking at him, it was like looking at the face of an angel. And they were so disturbed by what he said that they actually stoned him to death, but didn't stop. He, he didn't care what was going to happen. He was going to confidently say what he understood. We have a lot of examples back through the scriptures. Um, the uh, Daniel at the, for the lion's den and the um, fiery furnace and the men who wouldn't worship the idol that, was put out there regardless of whether it was going to cause their death or not they didn't know what the outcome was going to be but they weren't going to back off what they knew and understood and were going to testify to um can we get um another example can we get in first samuel 17 with david and goliath there's just so many as i started to think about all these great witnesses we have to um someone just being so confident in what they knew and understood that nothing was going to back them down. And 
if we could only, we pray to have that kind of absolute certainty and, and the ability to, to withstand these days. Um, with David and Goliath, um, let's see, I'm going to try and find that chapter here so I can tell you where to start. Um, let's start at 23, 1 Samuel 17, 23. Okay. Um, 23, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now, before, when you get a chance, read earlier in that chapter, they talk about Goliath and him threatening and challenging, and he was huge. He was six cubits in a span, whatever that actually is. It's a lot bigger than you and me. And David was a young youth. Um, so there was an incredible size difference just from a natural standpoint. And this Philistine had been talking, he'd been trash talking about Yahweh. And um, so David heard this. No one wanted to go up against this guy. And David heard the challenges and heard the, the words of this Philistine Goliath go ahead and all the men of Israel when they saw the man fled from him and were sore afraid and the men of Israel said have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel is he come up give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel and keep, he, keep reading and David spake to the men that stood by him saying what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living Elohim? All right, so David is, is just annoyed and can't believe the, the, what this Philistine is saying. Read. 27. And the people answered after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? So his brother got on his case saying, you left the sheep. You had a job. You left the sheep. Uh -huh. uh, I know that you're, you have pride and that you have naughtiness in your heart. So his brothers made some assumptions about uh -huh. David and David saying, what have I now done? Is there not a cause, not a reason for this? Read. 30. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go ahead. Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth. So Saul, Saul heard what David was saying and he asked to talk to David, but was, couldn't believe that David really thought he could go up against Goliath, read. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living Elohim. And David said, moreover, Yahweh that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and Yahweh be with thee. And so David explained that he knew already that Yahweh had delivered him out of some other situations. 
and he was viewing this uncircumcised Philistine the same way. He's, he was thinking in principle, each of these manifestations were no different to him because he knew that Yahweh would be the one fighting and would be able to deliver what needed to happen. Read. 38, and Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. All right, and so Saul then started to get David ready to go out for this fight. He, he realized that David was going to go, and he thought, well, if you're going to go fight, you're going to need to have all this special equipment that people wear when they go to fight. Read. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And David essentially said, I can't take something that's not been proven out to fight this battle. Mm -hmm. In principle, he realized that what he needed in order to, to battle against Goliath had to be something that he had confidence in, that he had trust in, that he knew would help him win this battle. And it wasn't any of the armor and all the, the weapons that Saul was giving him because they weren't David's and he had not tried them, mm -hmm. which is a lesson to us or a testament to us that we should not be trying to fight battles with things that we have not tested, that we don't have confidence in. We know the things that Yahweh has shown us it's different for each of us and maybe a lot for one person and not so much for another, but none of that matters. You just need to take those things that you have confidence in, that you have tried, that Yahweh has proved to you. And that's what are your weapons of warfare. Um, in, I think it's Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on the whole armor of, of Yahweh and the breastplate of righteousness and, and all the various pieces of all that. And it's all part of the things that Yahweh has given us. They're all physical examples. When you picture a knight going into battle, all of those things are examples of things that Yahweh has given us to fight those, um, the warfare in spiritual places that, have, that are going on these days. So David takes all that off, says, I haven't proved him. And then in verse 40, Gail, keep reading. What does he take? Mm -hmm. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. All right. So he's going out to fight a giant with his staff, five smooth stones and sling. Mm -hmm. Read. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a, a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. All right, and so the Philistine was busy trash talking or dissing David, and David just quietly says, I come to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts. Read. This day will Yahweh deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy thine head from thee, and I will give and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the field or of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is an Elohim in Israel. All right. So David says, I'm gonna come out a victor, and this victory is to prove to show that there's an Elohim in Israel. Read. And all this assembly shall know that Yahweh saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is 
Yahweh's and he will give into our hand and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. All right. And so David, David ran towards the Philistine, which everybody probably thought was crazy. And then he did his sling and a stone and got him right in the forehead and the Philistine fell dead to the earth. Mm -hmm. So young man, weapons weapons that no one would have thought should have accomplished anything except that he went out in the name of Yahweh and his confidence puts us to shame when you think about some of the things that we may face and and initially maybe have doubts as to whether Yahweh is going to be able to overcome them or or what it's going to take for for something to um to be resolved in our case so um the, the um the other thing i would like to get can we go to john the third chapter please and talk just for a minute about nicodemus and the conversation that yashua has with nicodemus do you like to start at one yes please john 3 1 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yahshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi. Okay, so um, hang on for a moment, please, Linda. Um, Nicodemus, ruler of, was of the Pharisees, ruler of the Jews, um, came to Yahshua at night. So I would say that that's an indication that he was ashamed or embarrassed or concerned about what people were going to think with this visit to Yahshua. If he was comfortable with things, people normally come to talk to you during the daytime. But not this episode with Nicodemus. Read. The same came to Yahshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from Elohim. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except Elohim be with him. All right. And notice that Nicodemus didn't say, I know. He said, we know. So he's coming and admitting that the religious elders recognize there's something special about Yahshua. Read. Yahshua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of Elohim. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yahshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it willeth, and thou hearest the sound of it, but canst not tell from where it cometh and where it goeth, so is every one that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Yahshua answered and said unto him, Art thou a teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? All right, so they have that conversation, and Yahshua ends up saying to Nicodemus, Are you a teacher or a master of Israel, and you don't know these things? Putting, uh, giving Nicodemus a lot to think about. And then Yahshua continues on in verse 12 and says something really important. If I have told you of earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? All right. So he's saying, if I can't even explain to you earthly things, there's no way we're going to be able to talk about heavenly things. Now, granted, this was before the day of Pentecost as well, but 
he was pointing out to Nick that he couldn't, he, there was no way they were going to be able to have much more in the way of a conversation. Now, skip back to verse 11, please. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we do know and testify to that which we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. All right, so what, what Yahshua says is we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. We pick up the same thing being said by the um, uh, apostles after the day of Pentecost with, in Acts. Could we go into Acts um, fourth chapter and we're let me, I don't want to pick up the, um, the entire storyline. So let's just pick up a couple of verses here, but this is, this is a key statement that we should all keep in mind because this should be our testimony. All right. X for Um, we will have gone through in three, they healed the impotent man. And then in four, they bring up Peter and John in front of the San Sanhedrin or in front of the council and ask them by what power, by what name you have done this. They express the importance of the name of Yahshua, that it's the only name that one can be saved in. And then pick up in 13, please. Mm -hmm. X three or X four and thirteen. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marvelled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Yahshua. All right, so minutes, they saw please. the boldness that they spoke by, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant. So they cared. They. Um, they were respecters of persons and they cared that these guys didn't necessarily have uh, learning in the scriptures. They, they had been fishermen or other types of trades and minutes, didn't please. rank up there in the hierarchy of things that they thought were important and that created authority in their minds. And they took knowledge that they had been with Yahshua. Keep reading. 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. All right. So they were unable to, like Doc saying, if you can prove according to the scriptures anything wrong that I've been teaching, then you come, you come tell me about it and we'll shut the school down. And here, these guys, they couldn't, they couldn't argue against anything. There was a, a man who had been well unwell and now was standing there the picture of health and able to walk around and how could they dispute that it was like the blind man who got healed and they couldn't argue against the fact that the miracle had taken place read 14 and beholding the man which was healed standing with them they could say nothing against it but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to, the, to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Yahshua. All right. So they thought the solution was to keep, to minimize the amount of um, additional information and, and rumors and news and drama that got out among the people was to tell the, the apostles not to speak or teach in the name of Yahshua. So they commanded them not to do that. Read. 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of Elohim to hearken unto you more than unto Elohim, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So All right. They... And, so, and so Peter and John said to them, 
again, with great confidence, there's, there's not any ashamed, embarrassed, um, uh, any reluctance on their part, whether it be right in the sight of Yahweh to listen to you more than to him, you judge that, you, mm -hmm. you make a, a call on that but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard and that they did with, with great authority, with great confidence. And it talks about in the, in the gospels about how Yahshua taught with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees and people listened to him when he preached in the, in the synagogue. Um, and then it just says they further threatened them and then let them go. So the, the lesson to us is, let's not be hesitant but let's confidently and boldly and with great joy speak the things which we have seen and heard and understand the things that have been given to us um not be ashamed of the gospel but but on the whole flip side just be able to to be really happy about being able to share those things whatever it is that we've we've seen um one last point when i was doing some research i came across a word um in it's in tabers and you can find it in some um dictionaries that are a little bit more extensive than um than others it it's spelled it's vishu gnosis it's spelled V as in Victor, I-S-U-O-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S -S. And it means the recognition and appreciation of what is seen or recognition, interpretation, and understanding of what is seen. And that just made me think about with what Deb had been talking about, about the blind man and the blindness being healed. We've been given the ability to see the fact that the blind man could now see things, it still was a physical healing and it still, it was probably a, a wonderful miracle to him to be able to see after being blind, but he still could only see physical things. It did not give him spiritual understanding. And we've been given the, the recognition and the appreciation of what we've been able to see now through the spirit and the eyes of our understanding. And thanks be to Yahshua that he has opened our eyes, um, cured us from that spiritual blindness that we had that we didn't even in a lot of cases know we had when we walked in the door. So thank you for the time, appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Sue Sikelski. And our third speaker this evening will be the Dean of the Oceanside Branch, Dr. Dennis Volpe. One minute. I... Hello, everyone. And I wanted to uh, say how much I enjoyed both lectures of our first two speakers because everything, everything they talked about is trying to get you to recognize and have your faith and confidence in Yahshua the Messiah. And I just want to make a couple of points based on what they were saying and I want to then go into something also in our scripture reading. Now when Sue was talking about uh, David over there and she also talked about having confidence and being established. Now what did that for David is that Yahweh gave him two witnesses. And without those witnesses, he would not have had that kind of faith and confidence. And the witnesses, as was read, that he killed both a bear and a lion with a slingshot. And so, fundamentally, uh, I don't think anybody's going on a safari, a hunting sa safari, and trying to take down a lion with a slingshot. I have not seen that yet. What I will tell you is there are things that Yahweh, will, when he does something, he does something extraordinary that is not ordinary. In other words, like I just pointed out, the fact that David realized that it wasn't his great slingshot ability to deliver out of the 
uh, uh, the death of these two creatures, the bear and the lion, he knew that Yahweh was the one that orchestrated that and was able to overcome those two beasts. And, of course, what Depp talked about with Lazarus, uh, when they first came to Yahshua to tell him about Lazarus, that he was sick, Yahshua, you know, said, oh, oh, he's, he's okay, and basically took his time and did not return to where Lazarus was. And, of course, when they came to him and told him that Lazarus had died, he had also made the comment that he was sleeping. And, of course, they didn't understand at that point what he meant by sleeping. And later he plainly said that he was dead. Now, he allowed Lazarus to die and then be in that tomb for four days. Now, that's according to the divine purpose that Yahweh had shut, set up. Because right from Adam, back there in the Garden of Eden, when Adam partook of that fruit, that pronounced death upon all of mankind. Everybody was dead from Adam on down. And therefore, what we find out is that Yahweh had promised a way to be delivered from that death, and that was through childbirth, as he told the woman, which led to the advent of the birth of Yahshua, or the Savior himself. Now, strangely enough, Yahweh waited 4,000 years. The chronology from when they came out of the garden down to the time when Yahshua was born was 4,000 years. Now, somebody get Second Peter 3 and 8, please. Second Peter 3 and 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Now here, that here Peter is saying, don't be ignorant of this one thing. Read. That one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now what Peter just did was he gave us a way to understand what we'll call divine chronology. That to Yahweh a thousand years is a day. And so therefore what we do is we look back and we understand that everything that Yahweh set up from the book of Genesis all the way down to the time of the Messiah was pointing to a spiritual operation of a purpose and plan that would be revealed later after the Messiah came in and died, buried, and resurrected. Now what we find out is in the Genesis, Yahweh when he created the uh, creation, and in Genesis it records that as he began to evolve the creation itself, uh, the, our solar system, the sun was put in on the fourth day. Now we attribute all of our natural existence and livelihood and being alive to the sun. Without the sun, we would not exist on this planet. Now that sun in the sky, what we call the S-U-N, is just a type, shadow, and figure or allegory of the S-O-N, which means the Son of Yahweh, who is the light of the world, that the natural sun is only a shadow or an example of. Now, if that sun came in on the fourth day in Genesis, because the seven days can be correlated to 7,000 years, also seven ages and dispensations and seven millennium, uh, what we're recognizing is that four days in divine uh, chronology would be 4,000 years. So when the death took place with Adam, you're going to find out that when they ate the fruit, now Yahweh said, in the day you eat thereof, Adam, you will surely die. Now the question arose, well, wait a minute, Adam ate the fruit, then he lived for 930 years. So how did he die the day that he ate the fruit? Well, there's two ways to look at that. Number one, Adam lived one day in divine chronology, or he died within the first day, which is the first thousand years after, from that point forward. But the founder said that Adam died the moment he ate that fruit. The moment he partook of that fruit of that tree, where he died was in his conscience. He received condemnation because of his disobedience, and that was the death of his soul. Now the natural body has to reflect that 
in type shadows or a manifestation, therefore his natural body lived 930 years or one divine day or chronological day of Yahweh. And then he died. But what we realize is that Yahweh set up his son right from the beginning of the purpose to come in and be that which would resurrect us from that state of death. Uh, somebody find over there a revelation about the lamb being slain uh, from the foundation. Revelation 13, 8. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Revelation 13 and 8. Go ahead. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the now world. Now it says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Can you give me the Moses chart real quick? Now, for those of you that may be fairly new to this teaching, I want you to see how Yahweh beautifully manifested these principles in your Bible but you would never catch them. You would never, by reading the Bible of your own at home, you're not going to catch these things because they're hidden in a mystery. And it has to be brought out by the Holy Spirit in order for you to see the divine purpose and how it works. Now, there was a lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now, I want to tell you about that. Now, the first bi book in your Bible is Genesis. However, Genesis was given to Moses in a vision on top of Mount Sinai. And technically, uh, well, from the standpoint of the purpose, technically, Exodus was the first book of the Bible, and Genesis was drawn out of that story of Exodus and became then chronologically the first book of the Bible. And that's where you can read about that in Exodus 24, I think it's 16. We're not going to get it where Yahweh called Moses at six days and then the seventh day he rest. Now listen, while Moses was in that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights up at the top of Mount Sinai, he was receiving a panoramic vision. And it wasn't Yahweh taking 40 days to carve out some stones. He was showing him a tabernacle and he showed him the, the creation coming in according to the pattern. Now, if you... Per, go down to the bottom of this chart, you'll see in the, in the land of Egypt, before they even get to the Mount Sinai, there was a plague of the death of the firstborn. Now listen, who was firstborn in, in, of mankind? It was Adam. Adam was the firstborn son of Yahweh Elohim. Now therefore, the firstborn that Yahweh's got this death of that is analogous to the firstborn, meaning all of mankind who are offspring of Adam, who was firstborn of Elohim. That's why Yahshua, and I can't get into all this in, in 30, uh, 20 minutes, uh, uh, told Nicodemus that you have to be born again. We're firstborn by virtue that we're offspring of Adam. Now watch. Down there in Egypt, there was a plague of the death of the firstborn, just as there was when Adam ate the fruit. Death was pronounced upon all mankind from that point forward. Now, what happened is Yahweh had them offer a lamb or slay a lamb, and they had to take and eat that lamb, and they had to take the blood of the lamb and put it around four points that were around the inside of the door of their houses, and they called that the Passover supper. Now, back, back, back down again on the size of the chart for a minute, Greg. Now, when you look at that, that's going on where the pointer is right there. That's where the Passover is inside their house. Now, after they ate that Passover, they came up out of the land of Egypt. They were led by the cloud to Mount Sinai, where they gathered around that mountain. You'll read about that in Exodus 24, 23, and so on. And then Moses was called up into the mountain in Exodus 24. And when he went up into that mountain, Yahweh then showed him the foundations of the creation. That is to say, the Genesis that he created and brought forth. But what I want to note here is that the lamb had to be slain first down in the land of Egypt before the revelation to Moses of the, how Yahweh created the whole creation, showing in type that the lamb was slain from the foundations of the world. Now, what that lends itself to is one other aspect, that 
Yahweh has a purpose in operation that he had masterminded and set up long before he created anything. Everything was formulated and he had a purpose that he was going to uh, bring this whole purpose to pass. Now, in that purpose, what Yahweh did was this. He elected, because in that state of pure spirit, he is impossible to be understood because of the, uh, uh, the enormity of, of, of what Yahweh is in terms of uh, spirit and attributes cannot be comprehended in that state. He had to break himself down and take on a shape and form right within himself in order to make himself known to his creatures. That form is what Moses communicated with in Mount Sinai. That form was Yahweh Elohim, in reality it was Yahshua, who was purposed from the beginning of the purpose to lay down his life for us, and therefore, when Yahweh took on shape and form as Elohim, what that set the purpose as far as it could not now be stopped, it could not be ended until the purpose was accomplished. Therefore, he was committed to his purpose, and Elohim or Yahshua, which is Yahweh now stepping into a lesser state, is destined and predestined unto being offered on that cross and to die for us. That's why we have the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now what I want you to understand is all of this is how Yahweh is expressing his great purpose to you and his purpose is to show you that he is salvation. So he has to manifest that all the way down through through what we call types, shadows, and allegories. And what we have is that example happens down in the land of Egypt. He saved the people, Israel was referred to uh, by Yahweh as his firstborn. And he told Moses to go down and tell Pharaoh to let Israel go, even my firstborn. Now, if he was sending an angel, a death angel, into the land to kill all the firstborn, that means that Israel would have died by the hand of that death angel if not Yahweh had given them a way to be saved from that, and that was they had to find a lamb that was without spot and blemish. That lamb had to be uh, uh, skinned. They had to uh, kill it by piercing it in the side and draining its blood out. It could have no flaws. They had to eat it, roast it with fire, and they had to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the inside of their doorpost so that when the death angel came over their house, there was they had, they had the lamb in them and the blood displayed uh, right within their houses, and therefore they were not slain by the death angel. So they were slain, they were actually saved by the death and the blood of that lamb down there from that plague of death in Egypt. Yahweh is manifesting his purpose of how he is salvation, and this is setting up examples, uh, manifestations, that the Messiah later comes in and says he has to come in to fulfill these things. Go over and get me uh, uh, John 5.39. Sorry, it takes so long. John 5 and 39. Mm -hmm. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now this is Yahshua speaking here to the Jews, and he tells them to search the scriptures. Now here's an interesting point. When he said to search the scriptures, he was not talking about the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why? Because they weren't even written when he made this statement. What was the scriptures was the writings of Moses and the prophets. That was always what the scriptures were referring to. The word scriptures. And listen, even in what you call the New Testament, when you hear them talking about scriptures, Paul, and even what's written here in John, it's a reference to you searching what's written by Moses and the prophets. And he said that those scriptures are pointing to him. Now here's why that's important. Because when the Messiah came in, how would mankind be able to identify who was the true Messiah and whether he actually came? 
because there were other men other than the one that we call Yahshua, the world called Jesus, that came to the Israelites and the Jews and claimed to be the Messiah. How do you know which one's the true one? Well, that's why you read in the Acts of the Apostles that, that uh, Paul, uh, go with the, uh, over to Acts 17 there again, where he went to uh, Berea and Thessalonica, I think it was, was it Thessalonica? But just go with the 17 there in the beginning. I don't want you to read right from what I want you to talk about when he goes into the synagogue. Okay. I don't have time to read it all. Um, and two, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture. All right, now here's where he was. Does it pick up there with it? He was in Berea. Where does it say he was? I think it's further down. Verse 10. And he's. Ten, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night onto Berea. All right, listen. They were the, the, the when they went into the synagogue the first time. Where were they? Um, Thessalonica. Okay, they were in Thessalonica. Now, here's what you got. Paul goes into the synagogue and begins to speak to them. Read that again. What you just read? How he went into the synagogue. First time or the second? At Berea? No, the one that you, the one where they were in Thessalonica. Sure, that's in two. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now he didn't reason with them out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because they weren't even written. Nor was Paul's epistle written that you're reading. Uh, that you read further. Acts of the Apostles wasn't written yet. So when he tried to reason with them, he went into the scriptures. Go ahead and read three. Opening and alleging that Yahshua must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Yahshua whom I preach unto you is the Messiah. Now, and that's what he was trying to do going into the scriptures. Now, we'll go down to Berea now. You said that was 10? Yep. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, mm -hmm. who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Mm -hmm. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things now when they came when Paul went in there and preached to them Yahshua out of the law and the prophets or the Old Testament these in in, in Berea searched the scriptures daily to check and make sure that they were correct or what they were saying was right mm -hmm. now the law and the prophets are two witnesses ladies and gentlemen they are witnessing to the Messiah that's why Yahshua in John 539 said search the scriptures search the law of Moses or the writings of Moses and the writings of the prophets because they're testifying. I mean, the word test, testify means to give witness. Now, what I want you to know is Yahweh has always worked with witnesses. That's the only way he works. And he has given witnesses to his pattern and his purpose through the things that he has set up down through the law and the prophets and manifested. And we didn't know how to do any of these kind of things before we walked into the door to go in there and show how the, how the things written in the Old Testament were pointing to Yahshua. Now in John 5, I think, uh, where we read at 39, he also goes on to say that if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now I never was taught when I was being raised a Catholic how that the Messiah was, uh, was written about by Moses. I never heard them go into the scriptures and express all the things that Yahshua did were in fulfillment, not instituting anything when he was walking, but he came to fulfill what was written in the scriptures so that you might know that he was the true Messiah. And Paul, who he didn't believe that Yahshua was the Messiah, was on his way to Damascus to uh, put to death other believers of Yahshua when he was knocked down and caught up into eternity, into heaven, and Yahshua spoke to him there and showed him a vision and later gave him a revelation that he might know that Yahshua was the true Messiah and he was already learned in the scriptures. 
But everything that he had learned, he realized he did not really understand it or know it. And later he called all the knowledge that he had, that he thought he had, he said it was but dung. Now down here in this school, our founders said, I came in here not to get rid of the, the Bible or to uh, uh, throw out what was written in your Bible. I came here to prove that what Moses said in the law, what the prophets said, and what the apostles preached, that it was so. So our founder told us to make him prove it. Now when he told us that, we wouldn't know how to make him prove anything. He had to teach us how the law and the prophets were set up as witnesses to Yahweh's purpose and plan and to the Messiah himself and salvation. So when you heard the first two speakers, they went back into aspects of what was set up in the law and the prophets to show you why the Messiah did certain things or how they were pointing to Yahweh's purpose. And that's how we are trying to get you to be uh, uh, educated into the divine spiritual purpose of Yahweh by showing you what's back in your Bible and then showing you what it's pointing to from the standpoint of the purpose and how it's consistently, not just once, but, but two, three, four, over and over again, witnessing to the same principle, the same idea, so that you can be steadfast, established, and have confidence in it. That's what we're doing down here. And if you're down here and you're beginning to explore, you will be amazed at how much you will learn in this school. Dr. Kinley said, this is not a church, it's a school. He said, and you come down here with the expectation of learning something, and that's what we're doing down here. We're trying to teach you what's in your Bible and get you to understand Yahweh's divine purpose and plan so that you have the evidence right there on your lap and you know how to go in there then and check these things for yourself so that you know that they're true. Now, uh, what I wanted to hit on in that uh, uh, scripture reading tonight, I don't have the time to, so I'm going to just go to another part of it, and we're going to go to a simple part. Let's go back over to John, 1 John, the third chapter, because we only have a few minutes, and that's okay, uh, because that was such a beautiful job the first two speakers did. I would be remiss if I didn't go back and try to give you some examples also in the Law and the Prophets to also go along with what they said. Uh, so let's go back to 1 John, the third chapter. I can't get my... Okay, 1 John, let's see here. I'm trying to get in my phone here. Uh, my Bible on my phone to get back there. All right, so what has happened, I'm going to say this very quickly. We didn't know this when we walked in the door that there, are, there was two covenants. We didn't know even that there was one covenant, for crying out loud. The first covenant was set up at Mount Sinai with the Jews, who were offspring of Abraham, that Yahweh had given Abraham a promise uh, that he would uh, bless his, his offspring, and he set it up with the lineage that came down from Isaac, through Isaac, Jacob, and then eventually uh, through um, uh, uh, Isaac. Well, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And they became the nation of Israel, and we call them the chosen people. Now, Yahweh made it in a covenant with them at that Mount Sinai where he agreed to be their Elohim, or God, and they were going to be his people. And he enjoined himself to them in such a way that he actually referred to it as a marriage, that she was his bride. Now, we didn't know any of this. That Yahweh, that was a wedding ceremony there at Mount Sinai. And guess what? There were no Gentiles at that wedding ceremony. When Yahweh spoke in the law from Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, those were given to the Jews and the Jews only, and all the other laws. They were not given to you and me, uh, if you are not Jewish, a Gentile. He never asked you to do any of those things. He asked the Jews to do those things. Well, also part of the, the whole scheme of things is that Yahweh knew that they wouldn't be able to keep it that it was contrary to their nature, and that they would sin constantly. So he had Moses construct a tabernacle that he showed him, which for all intent purposes, even though we tell you it's a pattern of all things, it's also a structure by which people could have the forgiveness of sins or be atoned for when they sinned. And guess what? Yahweh showed Moses how to build that before they even built the golden calf, which was the very first sin the Israelites committed after they agreed to do everything that Yahweh said and they were enjoined to him. 
Yahweh had Moses in that mountain ahead of time showing them how to build the structure to make an atonement for the sins that they would commit, not possibly commit, would commit. He knew that the law was contrary to their nature and they couldn't keep it. Now, that covenant lasted for 1,500 years. When the Messiah was born, he didn't he wasn't born, and that was the beginning of Christianity. He was born a Jew, or a Hebrew. He was out of the tribe of Judah, so he was a Jew. And he was born while that first law and covenant was still in effect, which means he himself had to keep the Passover, he had to be circumcised, he had to do the things that were in that law. Now he said, and I'm not going to have you get it because of the time being short. He said in John 17, in uh, uh, Matthew 5, uh, 5, 17, he said, Don't think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. That is to finish it. The word fulfill means to complete and finish. Nowhere in the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John that we call the Gospels did he ever say that he came to institute or set up anything or start anything. The word institute means to begin something. He said he came to finish, he came to fulfill over and over again. So he said the exact opposite of what we were taught in Christianity was his purpose for coming into the world. He had to first fulfill that covenant from Mount Sinai with the Jews. Move it out of the way so that a new covenant would be established that came in on the day of Pentecost, which was spiritual in nature. The first covenant dealt with Ordinances of the flesh. Give me the carnal ordinance chart, Greg. You there, Greg? Okay, I don't know what happened. I hope I hope you can still hear me. Can anybody still hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we yes. can. All right, I didn't know if maybe I got cut off. All right. <laughs> Uh, uh, I wanted that carnal ordinance chart, but that's okay. We'll, I'll, I'll just have to do it this way. Look, the first covenant was all natural, physical ordinances that were fleshly. They dealt with your flesh. It was, in other words, you were not allowed to eat certain kinds of food. You had to eat, you couldn't eat uh, pork, for an example. You had to eat something that was cloven hoofed and chewed the cud. You had to wear a certain kind of garments. Uh, you had to keep feast days, holy days, all these sorts of things. The first covenant were ordinances that dealt with the physical body and the flesh. It was a fleshly form of worship. We call it carnal ordinances. That's actually what it's referred to in the Bible. The new covenant is spiritual. It's no longer carnal form of worship, but it's a spiritual form of worship. And that comes in by the advent of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and then the receiving of the Holy Spirit how we are worshiping him, as he said in John the fourth chapter, he wanted to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So that's what's going to happen down here as you come down here. You're going to learn about the two covenants, the difference between the two, and what form of worship Yahweh wants to be worshipped now. And so what I just wanted to do is give you an overview I wanted you to understand something about what this teaching teaches. I know there's a, so much to it. We're constantly trying to get something out. We have to edit a lot as we're explaining it because there are hours and hours of details locked up that we could get into, but we have to understand that you got to just get an oversight of it first, and then little by little you'll get more and more fine points of it brought out to you and taught to you as you develop in your understanding. So... We are the sun. Just read that and we'll be finished. Read uh, for, uh, 1 John, the third chapter, and 3. And we are now become a son of our Creator. And John, who is after, this is written after Pentecost, had the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking to those that have also have the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. Read. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of Yahweh, Therefore, now listen, in my Bible, my Bible says the sons of Yahweh. Oh, mine says children. Okay. Did you the say sons that? Of children. All right, well, okay, King James, it talks, it says here that we should be called the sons of Yahweh. Now, the reason why I'm making a distinction is because everybody that was born in the world is a, ch is a children of God. Hmm. 
To be a son of Yahweh means that there's something that has transpired. And that means that you have been born again or you've been converted. Your soul is becoming a partaker of the divine nature, which makes you fashioned or conform to the image of Yahshua the Messiah. I don't mean his physical look. I'm talking about his characteristics or his nature. And that's what's happening under the new covenant. We are becoming a son through Yahshua and taking on the divine nature that is pleasing to the Father. And what manner of love is this that we should be called the sons? Those of us, as we are like everybody else in the world, we all come in uh, to the school carnal, with a, we violated our conscience, so we walk in the door dead on arrival. Where uh, Dr. Kelly said we come in DOA, dead on arrival, and we have to be raised from that state of death. And I wanted to say that for this reason, because the second, uh, the first speaker talked about Lazarus. Our founder used to say that Lazarus. They all marveled when he called him forth and he came out of that tomb. He said, "Did it ever occur to you that Lazarus had to die all over again and go right back into that tomb later on?" That resurrection was temporary. The one under the new covenant, and he told them, greater things than this will you do, he told his apostles. Because now when you're raised from the dead, you're raised psychologically and spiritually by the preaching of the gospel and of the purpose of Yahweh and the preaching of Yahshua. You're raised from the dead forevermore. It's not temporary. Your soul is risen, and your soul will never go back to that state of death that it was in prior to hearing these things opened up to you. So that's what you're going to get down here. You're going to, you're going to learn about your Creator, and you're, it's going to have an impact on you on the inside, and it's going to cause you to become established, and it cause you to be steadfast, and to have faith, and to be, uh, as David did, he relied on Yahweh Elohim to deliver him. That's what we do. We Our faith is in Yahshua the Messiah. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the class. I'm going to go ahead and turn it right back to the moderator and say uh, hallelujah to everybody. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Dennis Volpe. This will conclude our Zoom class for this evening. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday evening from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time and will now be dismissed by the doxology. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and forever, let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.